In this video, part two in the series on scroll trigger, we're going to go even further with the various options we can use with scroll trigger. Now, previously, we saw how the target element can be animated when the trigger element is scrolled into the viewport. And that looks something like this. Notice on the bottom left of the screen, when I start scrolling, as that fuchsia box comes into the viewport, it starts its animation. Here it is one more time. But what if we don't always necessarily want that target element to start its animation when the trigger element enters a viewport? Like, what if we want it to start at a different point? Let's say when the trigger element gets to the center of the viewport, or when the trigger element is 200 pixels from the top of the viewport. Well, that's what this video is going to focus on. We're going to look at two properties in particular. Those are the start and the end properties. And we're going to see how those can be used to set different start and end points for the scroll trigger. So let's get into it. So I'm back here in VS Code, and here you can basically see the code that we had from the previous video. The first thing I'm going to do, just to clean things up a little bit, is I'm going to get rid of this square 2 here on line 14 in the index.html file. Now over here, back in our app.js file, in order to get access to a lot more of the properties of scroll trigger, instead of assigning scroll trigger to a string like this, we're going to actually set the value of scroll trigger to be an object. And then inside of this object, we can set up our trigger element like this. We'll use the property of trigger, and then we'll set that to be the trigger element, which like before was the div with the class of square. And if we go back to the browser and scroll down, we can see it working just like before. Oh, snap! Now, as we said, what we're interested in doing is triggering that animation at a different point in the viewport, not just when it first enters the viewport, which is the default. So the way that we can do that is we're going to use the start property on the scroll trigger object. And there are a few different ways that we can set the value. The first way is as a number. So for example, let's say I gave the start a value of 400. If we come back into the browser now, we should see that animation start only when the viewport is scrolled 400 pixels. So let's try it out. We'll start scrolling down. And here you can see that fuchsia square is not doing anything yet until we get here, after 400 pixels of scrolling, and we see the animation start. The second way that we can apply value to the start property is as a string. So let's get rid of the number here, and we'll type a string, and the string is going to take two different values. The first value is going to relate to the part of the trigger, which is going to kick off the animation once it meets the second value, which we're going to input here, which represents a location in the viewport. I think this will become a lot clearer once we try it. So there are a few different options for the ways that we can type in these properties, but the first way is through the use of keywords, and we can use top, center, or bottom. So for this, let's say top and center. And what this means is that when the top of the trigger element, which is a square, meets the center of the viewport, that's when the animation is going to start. So let's save it, and we'll go back to the browser and try it out. So I'm going to start scrolling, and look for the point when the top of this fuchsia box meets the center of the viewport. Should be about here. There you go, and you see that animation. Woohoo! In addition to these keywords, we can also use percentage values here and pixel values. And we're going to try that out in a second, but before we do that, I want to show you something really cool. We can add a property here, which is called markers. And if we set that to true, Let's now go back to the browser and see what we have. So notice here on the right side of the screen, we now have these nice markers here. Start, end, scroller start, and here on the top you see scroller end. So what do these markers represent here? Well, remember in our code, we set start to be top, center. So since that first value is top, that's why we see start here. It's aligning with the top of this trigger element. And the end marker for now is at the end of that element because that's the default. And since the second value of the start property was center, you can see the scroller start here is in the center of the viewport. And the scroller end here is at the top of the viewport, which is the default. But as we said before, we can also use percentages and pixel values. So let's try altering the start values with percentages and pixels and see how that affects the markers. So let's go back to VS Code. And here, 
for the values on the start property, instead of top and center, let's say top and 30%. And let's go back to the browser now. And now we can see that that scroller start has moved from the center to 30% down from the top of the viewport. So when the top of the trigger element here, and we see start here, when that meets the scroller start, that's when the animation is going to start. So we'll scroll up and let's try it. Let's see how when that start of the trigger element meets the scroller start, the animation starts. So here we go. And boom, you see that animation start. Just as a side note, instead of a Boolean value here for markers, instead of this true, we can use an object if we want to actually specify the look of the markers. So I have an object I created already. I'm just going to paste it in. And here you can see some of the properties that I've altered. The start color, the end color, the font size, and the indent value. We also have access to the font weight property as well if we want. But let's just save this and take a look at the difference now in the markers. And here you can see they're much bigger, their color is different, the indentation is different. So altering the look of these markers can be helpful in development or when you're experimenting with your animations. Now, the other way of defining a value for the start property is by using a function. And I think actually before I show you how that works, I'm going to talk a little bit about the end property. So the first thing I'm going to do here is actually do a little bit of cleanup. So rather than setting the markers property to an object like we have here, I'm going to set it back to a Boolean value of true. So in order to illustrate how end works, I'm going to actually introduce another property here called toggle class. And we're going to set the value of toggle class to be a class which we're going to create in our CSS. We'll call it red. So of course we need to open up our CSS file. And as you remember, we're not using square two anymore. So let's just get rid of that. And let's create that red class. So dot red. And we're just going to give this a background color of red. So now let's close our styles.css file. And in app.js, for now, let's just get rid of this x property. And I'm using this toggle class property here for this example, just because I think it's going to make showing the start and end properties and what they do a little bit easier to understand. So toggle class, what that's going to do is once the start trigger starts, this class is going to be toggled on the target element on that square. So we're going to see its background color turn red. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add an end property. And this end property is going to set the point at which the scroll trigger has finished or ended. In which case that square element in this example is going to toggle back to its background color of fuchsia. So the end property works basically the same way as the start property. We can give it keyword values, top, center, or bottom. We could give it percentages. We could give it pixel values. It could also simply be a number, or it can be a function as well. But for now, let's give it some keyword values. So let's try center, and let's try 20%. So what this is saying is, when the center of the trigger element meets 20% down from the top of the viewport, the scroll trigger will then be ended. So we have our marker set to true. So if we go back to the browser now, we should be able to see these start and end points. So here we are in the browser, and here you can see the first value of start we said was top. So that's aligning with the top of this trigger element. And the end point, we said we wanted that to align with the center of this trigger element. Now the second value we gave to start was 30%. So you can see the scroller start here is 30% down from the top of the viewport. And we gave the second value to the end property. We set that as 20%. So you can see the scroller end here is 20% down from the top of the viewport. So what we should see here is when this start hits the scroller start, our square here should turn red. When the end point meets the scroller end here, that's when this square should toggle back to fuchsia. So let's try it out. Let's start scrolling down. And you see the start is almost meeting the scroller start. And then... Here we go, it turns red, and here comes the end, it's almost meeting the scroller end, and there we go, it turns back to fuchsia. Now let's go and take a look at how we can set the values of either the start or the end properties as a function. In this case, we'll look at setting the end as a function. So instead of this string of center and 
We'll get rid of that. And let's create an arrow function here. And what I want to return from this arrow function is a template string. What I'd like to do is I'd like to set the end trigger to be the height of the square in pixels. So for example, our square is 150 pixels in height. So I'd like the end trigger to be 150 pixels from this starting point. So this is how I can do it. First of all, we're going to need our comma there. But what we can do is we can write plus equals. And then because we're using a template string, we can do dollar curly brackets. And in here, we're going to first select that element, the div with the class of square. So we'll say document query selector. And then we'll get our square. And then we're going to use the offset height property to get the pixel value of that square. So now if I save and I go back to the browser, I should see the end trigger point be 150 pixels down from the starting point. So let's go check that out. So if I measure that out here, I can see, yeah, it's 150 pixels. Just to confirm that that works, let's go back into our CSS. And let's change the height of that square. Let's change it to be 350 pixels. And now let's go back to the browser. And there we can see that that end trigger point moves down to be 350 pixels from the start. So let's just confirm that. Yep, 350 pixels there. What's cool though now is that we can actually give this height a dynamic responsive value. So for example, instead of 350 pixels, let's say 20 VH. So that'll be 20 viewport height units. So now when we change the height of the viewport, the endpoint of our scroll trigger should follow along and should update itself to be whatever the height of the square is currently. Let's go try that out. Okay, and check out where our start and end points are here and check out our square. And so what we should see is if we reduce the height of the viewport, we should see these start and end points coming closer together. So let's go ahead and do that. Keep your eye on those start and end points. And here you can see they've become a lot narrower. Let's just see, it's about, it's about 100 pixels in height here. And now let's go ahead and increase the size of the viewport. And now let's go ahead and check the distance between the start and end. And we can see it's about 270 pixels maybe. So it's clearly increased since we increased the height of the viewport. So thanks for checking out this video in this series on scroll trigger. In this video, we learned about the start and end properties. We saw how we can turn scroll triggers value from a simple string into an object so we can access all these other properties. We also saw how we could use markers so we can get a visual representation of where our start and end points are. And in the next video, we're going to go even further with some more of these cool properties of scroll trigger. So if you enjoyed the video, if you feel like you got some value out of it, please give the video a like and consider subscribing to the channel so you can get notified when new content is released. See you next time.